So, uh, so this is our second panel of the day. Um, it'll be, we'll be discussing building and maintaining online communities, anonymity, defamation, privacy, oh my. Um, and I'm gonna hold about 20 minutes at the end, probably now uh, a little less than that, um, for Q&A. And um, uh, I'm David Ardy, I direct the Citizen Media Law Project. Um, I gave a brief introduction this morning about the Online Media Legal Network, and there's a, a bio uh, of mine in the, in the program, so I'm not going to spend any time telling you about myself. Instead, I'm going to tell you about this great panel that we have lined up today. Um, I, uh, I will start with uh, Pat Carome, who's on my left. He's a partner at Wilmer Hale. Pat has handled a wide variety of high-stakes litigation in both trial and appellate courts. He devotes much of his time to representing uh, representation of communications and media companies in complex litigation and counseling matters. In recent years, many of his clients have been leading internet companies. And I should add that Pat represented America Online in one of the most important internet cases uh, ever decided, at least in my opinion, and I imagine that Eric shares my opinion, um, in the Zarin v. AOL case involving the application of Section 230 that is, uh, that is uh, cited uh, now uh, 15, almost 15 years later quite, uh, quite often. Um, it was a great win for Pat. Um, Pat's areas of, of substantive, substantive expertise include defamation, privacy, copyright, trademark, press freedoms, trade secrets, general tort, and contract law. Uh, he's represented a broad range of clients on these and other issues, including before mentioned AOL, Time Warner, Craigslist, eBay, Google, Yahoo, The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, ABC, CNN, uh, and the American Legacy Foundation, which I've never actually heard of. Um, Bill Densmore, on his left, is the director and editor of the Media Giraffe Project at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and the New England News Forum, a career journalist. Bill has been an editor and writer for the Associated Press, for trade associations, uh, publications in business, law, and insurance, and a freelancer for general circulation dailies, including the Boston Globe. In 1993, after nine years of owning and publishing weeklies in Berkshire County, Mass., Bill formed what became ClickShare Services Corp., which provides user registration, authentication, and transaction handling for internet web content. Bill has also served as an advertising director for a small uh, group-owned daily and as an interim director for the not-for-profit Sh Hancock Shaker Village. He has taught and lectured in journalism at Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in North Adams, Mass., and was a director of the Action Coalition for Media Education. Um, Eric Goldman, on his left, is associate professor of law and director of the High Tech Law Institute at Santa Clara University School of Law. Before he became a full-time academic in 2002, Eric practiced internet law for eight years in Silicon Valley. His research and teaching interests, his research and teaching focuses on internet, IP, and marketing law topics, and he blogs on these topics at the hugely influential technology and marketing law blog. On his left is Jeff Howe. Jeff is a contributing editor at Wired Magazine where he covers the media and entertainment industries, among other subjects. Uh, in June of 2006, he published The Rise of Crowdsourcing in Wired. He has, contributed to cover the he has continued to cover the phenomenon in his blog at crowdsourcing.com and published a book on the subject for Crown Books in September of 2008, which I meant to bring and hold up so that we could plug it. Um, sorry, Jeff. Um, before coming to Wired, Jeff was a senior editor at inside.com and a writer at The Village Voice. In his 15 years as a journalist, he has traveled around the world working on stories ranging from the impending water crisis in Central Asia to the implications of gene patenting. He has written for Time Magazine, US News and World Report, The Washington Post, Mother Jones, and numerous other publications. Barbara Wall, on his left, is Vice President and Senior Associate General Counsel of Gannett Company, where she advises Gannett's many newspapers, broadcast stations, and websites on a variety of issues, including intellectual property, ethics, privacy, and libel. Barbara joined Gannett in 1985. From 1979 to 1985, she practiced law in New York City with the firm of Satterley and Stevens. She serves as chair of the Newspaper Association of America's Legal Affairs Committee and is on the faculty for the Practicing Law Institute's annual communications law program. She also sits on the boards of the Media Institute in Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia's Council for Court Excellence, and the Reynolds Center for Courts and Media at the University of Nevada. Since 2007, she has taught communications law as an adjunct professor at both George Washington University and American University. So thank you, panelists, for being here today. Um, we're going to start, uh, I'm going to start by asking a, a couple of, uh, we've already planned out the first couple of questions as a way to, to place this topic in a little bit of context and to understand some background. Um, we'll then dive into the conversation. Uh, it'll be much more free form at that point, 
And like I said, I'll try to hold 20 minutes for questions. Um, so the first thing, and I'm going to ask Jeff Howe this, is um, building and managing online communities. Why should news organizations be interested in building online communities? What's the benefit to doing that? Um, <clears throat> well, I think that, uh, I, I mean, first, it's, it's, and Bill's probably better uh, poised to, to address uh, news itself. But if, 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 if news organizations are anything like any other company, and I'm pretty sure they are, uh, then it, it behooves uh, any company to build a, a better, more robust partnership uh, with, the, with their customers. Uh, and, and I actually think that it's even more the case uh, when it comes to uh, a, a newspaper which has, has even more to learn from its readers than, than uh, you know, a, a standard widget company, say, may, may have to learn um, from, its, its, uh, uh, from, from its customers. I mean, but, but generally what, what I, I've been covering for the last four years in crowdsourcing is, is just seeing the extent to which uh, uh, customers are, are often more knowledgeable uh, you know, a, a, about a product than, uh, uh, you know, or at least have very valuable additions to make uh, to, to, you know, the, the process that the company's engaged in. Right. So, 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 Bill, tell us some of the things that news organizations are doing today um, to build online communities. Yeah, I, I spent a year at the, at the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri thinking about a concept uh, that we titled in one conference, From Gatekeeper to Information Valet. Uh, Josh was talking about how the role of news organizations is changing from that of the, the pinch point that controls what we all see to one of, of taking a, a, an economy that's just overloaded with information and trying to make some sense out of it, that sort of info valet function. And so as they do that, they've, they've, they've had to learn new ways of relating to the public. And I think they, they've been doing that there are six ways where I think that's, we are seeing that in the web today. The first place where it started to show up was newspaper websites allowing comments. And even though that's the thing that's been around the longest, as I think Barbara, Barbara mentioned when we had a pre-phone call the other day about this, it's, it's probably the biggest legal headache that she faces, and that's echoed by, I sent, a, I sent by the way, a post out on one of the listservs that we work on to folks yesterday asking them, some questions about this panel, and one of the people from Media News Group got back and said exactly the same thing Barbara said, that by far the biggest legal issues they face on a day-to-day -day basis have to do with comments. So comments were the earliest thing, but they're still the most, the, the, the most problematical thing. The other, the other way that, that news organizations started to reach out was to invite user-generated content, photos and video. And then I think you started to see the light bulbs going off with news organizations like Gannett and Tribune and McClatchy when they bought a controlling stake in Topics.net uh, probably eight or ten years ago now. Topics.net is, is an aggregator that goes out and scrapes websites for local news and then presents it and allows people to comment on it. So here you, you, you saw sort of these news organizations start to say, okay, I guess we've got to allow the aggregation world into what we're doing. The next thing that they've started to do was to permit their own reporters to blog. So again, starting to realize that the roles are changing. And, and, and that raises actually some interesting legal questions, and that is if, if a reporter says something on their blog, uh, is the are the same standards of accuracy and fairness and libel and slander applied there as, they would, as would be applied if the thing was in print? And then, uh, what's starting to happen now, and Josh mentioned this also in his talk at lunch, is newspapers are starting to realize that they can get into the aggregation game themselves. About uh, a few weeks ago, I think the Sacramento Bee launched something called um, Sacramento, I forget what it's called, but they have started their own aggregation site where they are they're finding all of the local news in Sacramento and presenting it. So they've realized they have to be in that game. And then the last thing, which is the most interesting, uh, I think, and really nobody's doing much of yet, is what, uh, what they started at Minnesota Public Radio a number of years ago called Public Insight Journalism, where you actually invite the public in to, to, uh, to contribute to your reporting. Right. So, so it might strike some people in this room as strange that a news organization would open up its site to publish the content of third parties that they have little control over. They don't know what they're going to say or do. Um, and as lawyers, um, especially those of us who counseled um, uh, 
journalism organizations that weren't online, that, that, that really doesn't happen. Um, it, w w why is it happening online? And give us some context. I'm going to direct this to Eric Goldman, who knows it's coming. Um, what's, the, what's the legal regime around um, these online communities that's allowing this kind of uh, innovation that Bill described to happen? So in my world, um, I break up content into two buckets, um, first-party content and third-party content. Um, it's really clean and easy to state. All you law students love those bright line tests. Um, so if you can fit things into first party content, all the traditional rules apply that you're familiar with. We worry about, for example, defamation standards and whether or not there's some adjustment to uh, some type of strict liability or negligence standard for defamation. Nothing new to really say about that um, when it comes to online publication of first party content. The more interesting aspect comes up when we're dealing with third-party content. And in the media industry, we deal with third-party content in a whole host of different ways. There's things that are very um, traditional, things like using freelancers or picking up stories from wire services, all of which might be characterized as third-party content in my world, um, to uh, allowing users to have their say uh, online. Um, things like providing places where r users can publish letters to the editor without having to wait for it to be filtered by the editor, or providing comments to stories where they're simply thrown open and allowed to, uh, users can attach their comments directly to a particular um, uh, piece of first party content. Um, and the rules, I think, um, uh, mostly cleave between first party content and third party content. If we're dealing with third party content, the overarching law that applies online is 47 USC 230. There's no offline analog to it that I can point to. Uh, it's a sweet, generous law for the internet that says websites aren't liable for third party content. Now, a lot of you are gonna start to say, well, come on, tell me more. There's gotta be more to that story. And there is a little bit more, but not much. For the most part, if you can characterize content being published online as third party content, 47 UC 230 says you're not liable for it. So when we deal with things like online comments that are submitted by users, if they're characterized as third party content, the website allowing those users to have their say aren't liable for it. Now let's talk about the exceptions, because there are a few. Um, this does not apply to intellectual property claims. So if users submit copyrighted material, there are separate ways to deal with that. Uh, the uh, the um, fundamental safe harbor is 17 USC 512, which allows uh, websites to uh, offload certain liability for copyright submissions um, uh, under a notice and takedown regime, basically. So long as they um, respond to notices, then they can avoid significant liability. There are some other ways that should probably issues come up in user comments, um, but they're actually quite minimal. Um, there are two other exceptions to uh, 230. Uh, they involve the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and state law equivalents, um, nothing that I worry about. And uh, they do not apply to federal criminal law. So if a user uploads child pornography, for example, um, 230 doesn't apply and we have to go to other legal principles. But when we're dealing with user content, or even potentially freelancer or wire service content that's being published by a media organization online, the basic rule is the media publisher isn't liable for the per third party content. <laughs> and so as a result, um, when I was thinking about this, I was trying to think, uh, we talked about uh, in our pre-call um, uh, the risks of legal liability for user comments. And I couldn't think of a single case that I've seen reach a final judgment where a media publisher has been liable for user supplied comments. Um, between 230 and the gaps that it leaves, which are pretty small, and the ways in which those gaps might be exploited, it's actually very hard to establish legal liability on the part of the publisher who creates the venue for people to have their say. So um, with that background, I'm gonna ask Barbara and Pat, who um, have to deal with questions all the time from their clients about the legal liability they may face um, for, uh, for building online communities. What, what keeps you awake at night and what kinds of questions do your clients have? I mean, Eric has painted a, a pretty clear picture here of how Section 230, so, so are we done? I mean, should we end the panel now? Is there, are there any issues that, uh, that we should be talking about? Uh, well, I'll start. Um, 
frankly, I'm not particularly worried about liability for, let's say, defamation for the comments that are posted, although many of them are extremely libelous. Because as Eric mentioned, the courts have um, recognized 230 uh, consistently and repeatedly as protecting news sites against liability for posted comments. Um, that said, uh, there are many problems with those comments that are posted, which are, you know, as I said, many of them are libelous, many are hateful, they're racist, they're vile, they're disgusting. Uh, people will post pornographic images uh, over and over again. Um, so, the, the, you know, we, we started our um, uh, online communities, and there was some discussion about why would a news organization want an online community in the first place. When, when Gannett launched its online communities, the thought was, um, that we wanted to be a big tent uh, in the community for discussion of ideas, topics, et cetera. And indeed, it has worked out uh, to be a good strategy, and I think uh, it's appreciated within the communities. But, but you know, you, you think of this nice, vital uh, civic discussion going on, ideally, when in fact, uh, often what happens is, um, is quite different. I mean, some of our our newspapers have had to close down comments on particular stories, often crime stories, stories that might involve minorities because of the racist comments. There are cruel comments that are posted. Uh, for example, in one of our newspapers at a smaller community, uh, 11th grader was killed in a car accident. And you know, you would think people would go online offering sympathy for the family, instead, uh, and who these people are, I don't know, but they, there were a number of people who went on and said, well, it just goes to show those parents weren't strict enough, they didn't have good rules, an 11th, uh, 11th grader shouldn't be out at that time of night in a car. And you know, piling on comment after comment critical of the parents of the child who had just died. I mean, this, this, is, this is really outrageous behavior. Um, so what keeps me up late at night is not so much fear of uh, liability for libel, uh, but rather concerned for the editors who have to somehow chart a course that is good for the community, good for discussion, and consistent with the newspaper's mission with these forums open to the public. And just picking up on what, what Barbara says, from my point of view, the question about how to, from a news organization dealing with this user-generated content, it for the most part really becomes a business judgment and a b judgment about protecting your franchise, your reputation, your name, your community, uh, rather than uh, legal liability or the risk of liability driving the type of policing uh, that, that these kinds of uh, online uh, communities or news organizations do. In response to the question, sort of what are the legal issues that are out there, they're really, when it comes to third party content, I mean, it, it, it's sort of looking at what, where are the edges of the immunity. And Eric mentioned the, uh, the exceptions. Those, that's one set of edges. Uh, and there has been some uh, uh, question about, well, is a, is a right of publicity claim, is that intellectual property or not? And does that fall within the exception or not? And there's that kind of issue. Probably the, the main edge of 230 immunity that comes up is the is, is the line between what is third-party content and what is not. And that can break down in a variety of ways. Um, perhaps uh, uh, one is, 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 is does if, if you, uh, it's clear that picking and choosing amongst content, the courts have said, well, that doesn't change it to your own content. Um, there is some sense that if you, uh, as the website operator, uh, request a particular type of content. If you set up a site that was strictly for false and defamatory criticisms of, of private people, and that's really what you were doing, uh, arguably you have sufficiently induced that content uh, so that you too are uh, partly responsible for its creation or development, which is really the, the legal test, is are you in responsible in part for it, the creation or development of the content? Uh, but there really haven't been many cases like that. A, a very interesting category for news organizations, which often have 
both employees and independent contractors or freelancers working for them is, well, is, it, it's normally, I normally sort of as, a, as an operating assumption uh, go in thinking, well, if you're an employee and you're operating within the scope of your employment at least, that's first party content uh, you're, you're, if, if your employer is the web, website operator. So there's no immunity for your own employees content that's produced in the, in the scope of their employment at least. Uh, the, to the extent there's law out there, uh, it would indicate that if you're an independent contractor uh, uh, who is not, and this, I think of it as being broken down according to the sort of the common law test between employees and agents on the one hand and independent contractors on the other, uh, if you're an independent contractor, that's third party content. The, the, the case that uh, most clearly addressed that, it was one of the early 230 cases, was the uh, 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 the Blumenthal versus Drudge and AOL case where AOL was, even though it was Matt Drudge's sole source of, of income at the time in, in the terms of the royalty payments it paid to, to Matt Drudge to have a special Matt Drudge version of uh, the Drudge report on AOL, Drudge was deemed to be um, third party, his content was third party content. Um, the, uh, a lot of, of, of folks ask whether a lot of my clients will ask, whether, well, can, can I go in there and edit uh, the content without, the third party content without sacrificing the immunity? And uh, I always, my pat answer usually is, is well, it's, it's safest to sort of follow a either leave it all up or take it down rule. Or if you do take, or, or what you want to be most careful of is not changing the meaning of a post such that you actually have sort of added the unlawful or tortious content yourself. I mean, the worst example would be taking out a knot as to whether or not someone's been convicted of a crime, for example. Um, uh, but, but Pat, I want to interrupt. Uh, can I interject something on that? Sure. So that issue comes up a lot. We, the, we do a lot of training um, with uh, uh, online editors, and they always come with this misconception that if you touch it, you own it. And I don't know where that comes from. And clearly, that Section 230 doesn't say that. Um, I would bet that. Eric's view it would be slightly, I mean, you're painting a picture then that's, 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 that's a very um, risk minimization approach. I mean, that's, and that's a, a lawyer's job is to communicate to the client what the risks are, let them make a business decision. But there are a lot of news organizations out there that do, or a lot of uh, community development people that get their fingers in the content. And I want to make, I want to explore that issue a little bit more. I mean, obviously, if you materially change the meaning, so someone puts a post up and says, um, David's not a murderer, and you take out the word not, so it says David's a murderer, you materially change the meaning. That's at the one extreme. There's a lot of space in there, however, that might be worth exploring, and I, get, I see Barbara nodding, and Eric. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, out on that. I think where you um, own something for libel purposes is where you've added something that's defamatory. Right. Or, 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 by, or take something out. Or take something out that would be statement. exculpatory. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I guess risk minimization in a company with uh, over 35,000 employees, uh, we've, we've, we've said the safest thing is up or down. But certainly, you know, for a blogger who has comments, et cetera, and can carefully curate those comments, I mean, I, I, m m I, would, I would defend up to the point of materially adding the defamatory meaning or taking out the exculpatory meaning. But can I just add another um, interesting twist? Uh, and this exists for the forums that are on traditional news sites. Um, and, and these are you know, user-generated com comments coming in on story chat or forums or what have you. What I'm finding is that culturally within the newsroom, uh, it creates a lot of uh, you know, sort of disconnects because you're basically talking from a legal standpoint of two completely parallel universes. Uh, li traditional libel law for print and broadcast functions on the premise that tail bearers are as bad as tail makers. And if you repeat a libel, you are responsible for that libel with a few exceptions, such as quoting from an official document or something of that nature. Uh, I mean, on TV, for example, if you put the microphone in, so in front of somebody's mouth and they say something defamatory, you're responsible for it. Um, and so I'm having a hard time now with some of the younger reporters coming in who have grown up in the world of forums and chats and uh, the internet in general, convincing them that somehow they're responsible for everything in the newspaper. 
um, regardless of the source. And, and, th and that is true legally. I mean, letters to the editor, advertisements, you name it. If it's in the newspaper, the newspaper is going to be responsible for it. So I find that an interesting intersection of, you know, the, the generations for one, but secondly, completely different legal frameworks, all existing in the same newsroom um, and with the same staff. Yeah, especially when you have an integrated newsroom where right. they're doing both online and print. Right. Yeah. And Eric, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I want to go back to this notion about um, the two polar extremes between um, being an editor of content and taking full liability for all the editorial choices, even the decision not to do something, and taking a passive conduit style approach. And I think those of you trained in uh, taking a media law course or a journalism law class, um, that's how it was taught to you, that you, you, you get to pick. And you may not even get to pick the passive conduit route. That may not be an option for you if you're in uh, the uh, media world. Um, but if you're going to try to fit into some kind of passive conduit road, uh, approach, the only way you'll avoid liability is by doing nothing. And online, that's not really an option. It's, you know, we could talk about what it means to do nothing, but the reality is that's not an option that's worth considering. What we know happens is if you do nothing with user content, it goes downhill fast. You have to do something to keep the conversation from going in the wrong direction. Um, so now we're only talking about how much are you going to do. It's not what, it's not if, it's how much. And I think it's an old way of thinking about things to say, well, now the moment that you've made the decision to intervene in this pool of user content, that you're now automatically responsible for all of it. We run to that all the time because that's the way media law used to work. But that's not the way that's online. Why, and that's why 230 was passed. And it was in response to a court decision that said specifically that. And what, I don't know whether John Hart is here yet. Yeah, d John and I always say, right after the decision that, that uh, the Stratton Oakmont case, which laid responsibility uh, on Prodigy for editing comments because the court said they were acting like a traditional publisher. Um, at that point, obviously, we had to tell our clients about that development in the law. And John and I always joke it was the stickiest piece of legal advice we ever gave uh, because uh, shortly after that, Section 230 was passed. It changed the law. It was passed so that specifically, uh, uh, online community editors could edit, uh, delete, take down things that were offensive and not t in so doing take on the responsibility of the publisher. But you're right, there's so many people who never got it out of their head that that law changed. And, and I just want to reinforce that what 230 does is it protects the editorial judgments of online publishers. If you are dealing with third-party content, your editorial judgments toward them is exactly what the statute immunizes. And that's what's so counterintuitive. Because in the traditional publication, when you've got your newsroom, people are saying, you guys are responsible for everything. Whereas here, when you're doing the exact same function, that's what gets you the immunity. In fact, I mean, the law actually has a second prong to it, that Section 230, that goes beyond just the basic immunity for third-party content. Even if the facts were that you, in attempting to make a story less offensive to your readers, if you mistakenly, though in good faith, that was your purpose, but if you mistakenly did make it defamatory, in fact, there's a second provision, uh, C2, which says you can't be held liable for any act you've done uh, that was part of a good faith effort to um, restrict or block uh, access to offensive content. So it's a very, very strong set of protections. It's called a good Samaritan statute on the theory that when you're trying to do something good, you shouldn't be penalized for it uh, for, uh, from the liability standpoint. So another big misconception in this area is around notice. That um, if a news organization gets an email that says there's a post up there about me and it's defamatory and I demand you take it down, does the website, does the, does the news organization lose immunity if it refuses to do that. Now, there, we've got a great case that, that sort of answered that question, and Pat was involved in it. Um, th I mean, actually, that, was, that is the Zaran case, which was the first case decided under the statute back in 97. Uh, and many people who had been involved, even in the enactment of the statute, felt that it wasn't really meant to be an immunity if you were on notice. It was just to sort of put you to the same, the, stat the language of the statute is don't treat you as a publisher, and there, uh, 
And the notion was that, uh, well, there's a, there's a different set of rules for distributors. Those are like booksellers, uh, libraries, and, and the like, who are sort of clearinghouses for third-party content. And the rule for, quote, distributors, uh, uh, at least in the defamation area and, and, and other areas, really as a matter of the First Amendment, is you can't be held liable absent notice. And so there were many people, very smart people, at, before Zarin was decided, who said, well, it's not going to turn out to be an immunity if you were on notice, because that's not treating you as a publisher, that's, quote, treating you as a distributor. And that was the main argument that uh, Ken Zaran's lawyers made in that case, and it was rejected, that, that distributor liability is still treating you as the publisher, it's putting you in the shoes of having to make the decisions about whether or not to run or not run stuff, and that's classic editorial publisher-like behavior. So that's treating you like a publisher. And that, uh, you know, I, I, before the case was decided, didn't give us better than a 50-50 shot that it would come out that way. But that, that has, in fact, been the, uh, uh, that's uh, been held very, very firm you uh, across the court. A few speed bumps, but generally that's right. Yeah. Uh, I would just add that um, when uh, I am working with a website that received notice of problematic content, if it's covered by 230, we know the answer from a legal standpoint. We can toss a notice in the circular file, and it doesn't change our liability one bit. But it does raise a question about the brand of the institution and whether or not it's publishing inaccurate information in a way that is doing harm to its readers. And so I've, I pose the question back to the website, okay, you, let's get the lawyers out of the room now. That's really good news now. You can actually have a healthy conversation. With that healthy conversation, what do you want to do in order to, to manage your brand and the accuracy of the information you're publishing? Well, I think that's a good segue to bring Jeff and, and Bill into the conversation a little bit because we, we've been talking about the center and, and Pat mentioned and, and Barbara mentioned what they worry about are the edges. So let's, let's move to the edges. And uh, when you're talking about a news organization that's um, cutting its staff, doing a lot more activity online, it's generating these, uh, these robust communities, and it simply doesn't have the people to moderate the, the discussions. Yet, the discussions are very important to the organization's brand, its franchise, the way it's perceived in the world. Are there ways we can learn from crowdsourcing that um, news organizations are thinking about or have been doing to try to manage these online discussions? So, and we'll talk about what the legal liability might be for that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm mindful of, uh, this is actually a formulation from an executive Econet, um, but I think, it was, I th I think it's, it's, it's pithy and it's telling. I mean, that's that, you know, newspapers, have uh, for a long time been essentially, uh, historically, been a monologue uh, with a little bit of dialogue taking place in terms of letters to the editor. And that, that in the internet age, they, they've just begun to get their heads around the idea of, of being a dialogue. But that what they don't understand generally is that the readers don't want a dialogue. They want what uh, this particular executive calls a polylogue, which is to say lots of different voices. And more to the point, they just want the newspaper to be the room in which the conversation takes place. They don't always necessarily even care what the newspaper has to say. They just need somewhere uh, you know, uh, in which to have this conversation. And perhaps a news article uh, serves to uh, uh, you know, instigate this debate. Or if it's something like the mom sites that you guys do, then maybe it's a bunch of moms who want to talk about some issues that the moderator has raised. But they don't necessarily want or need the moderator to take uh, you know, an overweening role. Uh, in, in the conversation. And that definitely tracks with, uh, you know, I mean, my mandate is to look at newspapers as one of, of, of lots of different uh, verticals in the industries. And, and it definitely tracks with uh, the process that other companies are having to go through, too, which is, is to understand that, that they're, they're having to uh, let control of the brand a little bit and understand that, that it's, there's a, a process of co-creation uh, going on where, uh, where these communities are, are, you know, want and will demand to have a say. And, and is there a way to enlist the community itself in the moderation process? Uh, that's and, uh, a standard formula at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Whether that works, uh, you know, 100% of the time is another question. But so yeah. are, you see, are you seeing any of that with uh, the folks you work with? Well, it's interesting. I, I live in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and a group of us are, have just formed a nonprofit to start up a local online news community in Williamstown. And yesterday at lunch, we were talking about this question: Well, what are we going to do about comments? And one of my colleagues uh, said, look, in a community this small, uh, the, that will take care of itself because you know who everybody is. And so I think the central issue is uh, whether or not you allow anonymous con uh, comments. Most uh, 
I would say generally most smaller websites don't allow anonymous comments anymore. Um, some of the larger ones can get uh, away with it because of Section 230. But I think that, that this issue of figuring out a way to create a sense of community is, is the answer. And I'm, I was just thinking here as we were talking that it's almost a little bit like the Scarlet Letter where you, if you have a group that is niche enough and close enough, the, the person who makes the out of bounds comment is gradually going to be shunned by the community. And so then that person has a decision to make. Do they, do they, to make. Do they want to be an outlier and be shunned by the community or do they want to play nice? Mm -hmm. Bill, just to clarify, and that involves a repeat play situation where everyone is um, interacting with each other in yep. multiple iterations. Obviously, when you throw the door open to the web, you always have the risk of interlopers and those people may or may not abide by the same rules. That's why I think you, that's why I think this is more viable if you're talking about a specific topical or geographical niche where, where the people are interacting with each other on an ongoing basis. There also are some technological tools that are available. For example, uh, in the Pluck platform, um, there's a reported views button. I'm sure you all have seen that. Uh, and, you know, there are various options available for the website, but most will, you know, choose the option that says if there are three report abuse buttons uh, on one comment, it goes into a holding area. Um, and in the holding area, it will be reviewed by somebody from the newspaper or the TV station, and they'll decide whether to put it back or leave it out. Uh, but of course, these online communities are very vibrant, vital um, places. And so in some of our communities, we've seen you know, polarization, let's say, of political views. And so if someone posts a comment that is conservative uh, and the liberals don't want that to be displayed, they'll put report abuse. Uh, and then pretty soon, they're all, you know, all the conservative comments are in the holding area or vice versa. I mean, so, so no tool is perfect, uh, we've learned. So I want to go back to a comment that, that Bill mentioned about um, having the reporters uh, engage with the community as well. And some news organizations are doing that through blogs. Um, some are allowing their reporters to actually post comments and um, participate in the discussion. Some other news organizations say, no, you're not going to comment at all. Um, uh, we don't want you interacting that way. Do, do you have a feel, um, especially Barbara, um, you know, is, 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 that a, is there a policy in Gannett on allowing reporters to engage in those discussions beyond the, 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 you know, the, the one piece they've done? Uh, um, they can, although, and I think this is universal throughout Gannett, the comments appear um, in a special color ink so that it's clear that it's somebody from the newspaper who's, who's making a comment. And it's useful sometimes to get discussion going or to try to, you know, throw out another topic that might uh, be productive for the community to discuss. Um, but, you know, when we were first starting out, uh, there were reporters who would do that, and then some thought, well, gee, that's misleading. It's not 100% clear that it's a reporter making that comment, which is a valid point. So in any event, we've been sort of finding our way. Um, I, I, I think it varies depending on the type of story and the time of day and who has time to do it, but, uh, but it, it can be very productive. Why the special, I, I mean, I think I understand what you're saying, but why the special link? What, what's so, the okay, so if reason? you're, a, you, if you're let, let, let's say um, you live in Des Moines and you come to the Des Moines Register website uh, and there's a report about the school system um, and people are saying, well, you know, I really think the union negotiations are having a you know, negative impact on the teaching and the community and this, that, and the other thing, and, 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 uh, and the report, a reporter goes on and makes a comment and, and this has actually happened, you know, at night from home. Um, perhaps this, you know, perhaps a comment that would be biased one way or another uh, or would, sh would send the conversation in a certain direction or another. It was felt that the people who were using the forum should know that that's a staffer doing it as opposed to just some member of the community. I mean... There's, there's no uh, you know, there's frankly, no requirement under Section 230. Oh that, God, that, no, that no. This is clear. just a this is just an ethical point, and and really, 
actually, um, there were stories floating around because every newspaper was adopting forums at about, about the same time that reporters would be commenting on their own story about what a great story it was and things like that. <laughs> well, that stop, so, stop yeah, puppetry. yeah, there you go. <laughs> so there was a little bit of that behind the uh, special color ink, too. Yeah. Right. Do, do you worry as a lawyer advising uh, clients that have reporters who are engaging in the sort of hurly-burly of, uh, mm -hmm. of online communities that they're going to somehow get the organization in trouble? For example, um, when I was at the Post, we were always worried about the reporter, you know, we, working, we worked very carefully with them to, to, to get the piece out. It came out in the paper, and then the next day they're on the local news uh, station doing an interview about the story, mm -hmm. and they, they start talking about all kinds of other things, and all of a sudden you're worried, well, wow. yeah, no. you know, we, we, we really squared the corners on this, and now all of a sudden it's all ragged. Um, do, you, do you worry about that, and, and what role do, for example, the lawyers uh, play in, in that? Well, I you believe. can't sit next to them all day long. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just have to remind them that, um, and, and, and again, it goes to the point that Eric was making, um, you know, in an online forum, we as an organization are 100% responsible for the comments that are posted by our reporter and 0% responsible for the other comments. And so they have to be mindful of the fact that every comment that they make is one that we would have to defend, uh, both legally and that they would have to defend journalistically, not that they would really want to go out on a limb on that. But, and as well, they wouldn't want to make comments that might reveal a uh, confidential source or um, you know, other things that, again, as you point out, you're very careful with in constructing a news story for print. Uh, and the hurly-burly of the conversation might get a little bit uh, you know, less, uh, well, less structured, um, and mistakes can happen, but we've never had any, actually, so. How, how does it work at Wired, Jeff? Do, do, are you given any, uh, is there a policy for you engaging with commenters on the pieces that you write? God, no. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, one, because the DNA of Wired is that we, we came up from, uh, you know, I mean, it was created by a bunch of geeks on the left coast. So, I mean, we were part of that culture where, uh, uh, you know, the, the, especially the early internet, I mean, it was coming out of, like, you know, whole earth catalog and some very, uh, you know, in the e uh, EFF. So it was very, uh, it was very, uh, you know, oriented towards open source and the absence of restrictions. But um, also because I think our readers uh, would not expect that. Uh, and also because I, I'll, the Wired is written by independent contractors. It's not written by staff. It's not like a newspaper. So Well, uh, let me just get this. I mean, you're saying it's, there aren't rules, but you're not going to, post something that's false, correct? Well, there are rules I follow as a journalist. That's, I mean, that's all I, I was talking about. Yeah. But there's no policy. I mean, there's no policy that I'm following. It's like, you know, Wired has never had to say, you who write for Wired should publish the truth. I mean, there's, you know, that's, that's assumed that we will do our best. There's rigorous fact check that goes on. We do have legal review. Um, but, you know, I'm allowed, uh, there's so it no doesn't prior doesn't sound that different to me, then. <laughs> Oh. Is it different, though, Jeff, between the, the legal review that happens on the primary piece you write and then potential comments that you engage in with the... Uh... Yeah, no one's ever drawn that distinction. And I guess what I'm mindful of is a lot of newspapers, there's a big, long debate of can reporters tweet? Like, I mean, that was never, I mean, that was a risible debate at Wired. We were like, what? Like, really? <laughs> like, that's even, like, a consideration? That's something you guys are talking about? Like, of course you can tweet. Like, like I am, you know, I'm Jeff Howe, and I also write for Wired, and, and the readers are cognizant that there's that both identities. I don't, it's, it's different in a newspaper, and I think for a lot of good reasons. I'm just explaining why Wired operates the way it operates. Well, one of the, one of the things that um, has been much discussed uh, of late are the ethical guidelines that AP and other news organizations have issued on social media and tweets. And the thought there is one that's, you know, existed in newsrooms for many years, and that is you don't want to you don't want to tip your political preferences uh, so that the reporting that you do will be undercut. And so some of the guidelines that I know people have made a lot of fun of are really designed to reinforce the notion that reporters are meant to be objective. Uh, and, and, and I know online maybe th that, that, that there's some skepticism as to whether anybody can be objective, but we're still trying to produce objective reporting that is not biased politically one way or another. And tweets um, and social media, uh, to the extent that they might involve tipping one's political views, uh, are, I think, still an issue for news organizations that are more traditional than Wired, perhaps.
So um, this is something where I think we're seeing a, um, another facet of disaggregation between print publishers and their reporters. Um, a lot of times reporters develop their own fan base, um, but the publishers haven't made it all that easy for the fans to follow all the stories that the particular reporter writes. And uh, I, when I talk to reporters, I encourage all of them to set up a Twitter account not because they might reveal new information about themselves that might, might undercut their journalistic um, uh, integrity, but simply because this will be a way for their audience to find the stories that they write. And I say, you should have an account where every time you post a story that has your byline, you should provide a link to it. That way I can see everything that reporter is writing. And I've been watching reporters have actually been doing that, and all of a sudden they develop b massive audiences that have been hidden by the fact that they're just part of this larger organization that otherwise was obscuring their fan base. And so in some sense we're seeing reporters break away from the brand of the publication associated with, developing their own fan bases, and that's actually becoming more powerful than the, than the audience of the publication they work for. So uh, part of the title for this panel is uh, anonymity. And um, we've sort of brushed the subject a little bit, but now I want to spend some time diving into it because um, a lot of what we're talking about anonymity underlies both the challenges, I would say primarily the challenges, but some opportunities as well. Um, and Eric, you mentioned earlier that w if you're going to allow, um, it goes to Bill's point about the community to sort of create through norms some self-policing, you need some form of consistent identity. Um, and, uh, and that's a big issue for news organizations, whether in the first instance to allow anonymous commenters at all to the site. Um, it's, it seems pretty clear, unless any of you disagree, that there's no difference in the legal liability a news organization has for allowing online anonymous comments or not. It's a question of what kind of a community do they want. And, um, and, and then some other, perhaps, some other journalistic decisions. So, Can we just clarify our terms, by the way? Because yeah. uh, the, the term anonymous online is always filled with peril. Um, what I think we, you mean by anonymous is where someone is able to not attribute the source to their name, but actually then converting that to true anonymity would require a substantial amount of work on the part of the, the commenter to mask their tracks so they could never be traced. Otherwise, a lot of times we're really talking about pseudonymity, mm. that they have some type of uh, masking identifier that, um, that the comments will be attributed to, um, but that someone doing the appropriate work would be able to figure out the ultimate uh, identity of the person who's posted. And so uh, I want to make sure we're talking about the yeah. different facets. I think a lot of time when we talk about anonymity online, we're really talking about pseudonymity, which means we're not talking about anonymity, and in fact, people can be identified for the work, for the contributions they're making. Definitely. But just to be clear, the pseudonym is often, in fact, usually anonymous. I mean, I agree with you, right, but that is what it looks like if I'm on the forum, is that, right? It, it can be totally, it could be that, it could be Or they've a, made up a name. They or, could be yeah. an okay. alias that they picked, right. or it could be an IP address, and it's right. simply attributed to their IP address, and right. each of those would be called anonymous by, I think, lay people, but I don't think right. that all of them would have the same implication. Yeah, yeah. no, it's a great point. I mean, it's certainly true that for the most part, uh, your identity can be uh, obtained, uh, even if you've gone to significant lengths to try to uh, block it. And uh, there's a lot of law developing about what are the circumstances in which that can lawfully occur. Um, tying it to Section 230 a bit, it, it, in my mind, there, there, there's a trade-off. You can't have the website uh, both saying we're not immune we're not responsible for third-party content, and at the same time, uh, blocking the ability of a potential plaintiff who has a real cause of action really needs that information from being able to uh, uh, secure the the online entity's cooperation in, in turning over information uh, to identify the tortfeasor, if it really is a tortfeasor. I think there should be lots of protections in place, and the courts are putting them there, to prevent that from happening uh, for the wrong reasons and for not really the furtherance of a real uh, uh, good faith cause of action. But, but you're not saying, however, Pat, that there's some obligation on the news organization to, main, to, to create those records in the first place and maintain them for some period of time in order to uh, provide it in response to a, a request. I think that's right. Uh, you, you may not 
you don't have to keep the registration information unless you got it temporarily and you receive legal process or a notice that you're about to receive legal process. And you can't, at that point, you may end up having an obligation to keep it uh, uh, for, for, for temporarily. But um, uh, it's often the case that even if you haven't had registration information, you, you still have uh, in your, deep in your web logs, uh, traces of information that can be used to uh, track down, mm -hmm. may take several steps, several lines of subpoenas to uh, find the, who, who the speaker was. But, but Pat, just to be clear, um, a website that flushed its server logs instantaneously, that did not capture anything about the usage of its servers, would still be fully eligible for 230 for user supply. Credit. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, there aren't, I, I, in my experience, there aren't many websites that do that. No, but they could, and 230 contemplates that, and so it does set up the potential where the website says, look, leave us alone, go after the bad guys. Oh, but we can't help you find the bad guys, sorry, not our problem. And, and 230 does set that up, and in my opinion, that's actually a part of the statutory brilliance, not a defect in the statute. I, I, don't, I don't disagree at all. In, in the Zarian case itself, no one was ever able to find the identity of the, of the true author of the material. So, so if, a, if a site does have that information, um, what's its obligation to turn it over? Well, I mean, is, is, it, is it somebody makes a phone call and says, uh, I don't like what uh, uh, this, this commenter said about me, can you identify them? Is that, uh, is that typically enough for a news, I mean, most organi news organizations turn that information over? I think it varies from news organization to news organization. Um, at Gannett, our policy is not to turn over the information in response to requests. And, you know, you ask what keeps me up at night. We, we, we get dozens and dozens and dozens of requests for the identity of posters. Um, and I, before today's session, I thought I'd just tote up how many formal subpoenas we'd received and how many we've fought in court, because we do that as well. Uh, and again, against the backdrop of hundreds of, of requests, we received 21 subpoenas. Uh, of those subpoenas, uh, five were from individuals who felt they'd been defamed by a poster. Uh, Thirteen were from the police or the government or a grand jury. And three were uh, requests for the commenter's identity because it appeared that the commenter had information about a civil lawsuit and, sh and could give testimony in that civil lawsuit. Um, and of those 21, 15 were withdrawn after we jawboned the lawyer a bit about you know, the right to anonymous speech and such and the fact that we would make a motion to quash the subpoena. In six of the cases, we actually made um, motions to quash the subpoena. Um, we had two victories where the subpoenas were quashed Two more were withdrawn, uh, and two resulted in decisions which I like to call half a loaf, because those are decisions where the court said, well, um, we're going to make you turn over the information, but that's because the plaintiff has met a higher test, a higher threshold to show that he or she is entitled to that information. So all that's to say that at Gannett, we think we owe something to the posters uh, who come to our site and post anonymously and expect to remain anonymous. That said, there is, there is, a, there is a limit to that. Um, I mentioned on the call the other day, the day after the Virginia Tech shootings, someone went on one of our websites and said, Cho, who was the shooter at Virginia Tech, is my hero. I have guns. I can't wait to go to school tomorrow. Um, Show of hands, how many people think you ought to protect the identity of that poster? Yeah, I mean, so they're easy. Did, did I see one? There was, there was one. I won't, I won't point the person out. Oh, okay. And, and not to say wrong with that. No. No. Barbara, can you clarify? You said 21. 21 in what time period? Well, probably since 2007. So in the last three years or so? Mm -hmm. That's not that many, given the size of your organization. Well, as I said, we get many, 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 many requests that we just talk the person down on. And none of those were copyright related? You didn't none. get any? Mm -mm. The, the, uh, the big online organizations, uh, you know, Google, Yahoo, AOL in the past, uh, 
have whole staffs devoted to processing uh, subpoenas from both law enforcement and, and private parties. Um, on the whole, um, the, the first point of guidance, I think, for a, a news organization on what to do with response to, in response to requests for identity or other user information or subpoenas is to look at the privacy policy uh, that virtually any organization is going to have in which it sets out its, its policies. Those will uh, likely be viewed by a court as setting up obligations that you've undertaken to honor. And uh, so there's a lot of care needs to be go, go into how an organization writes that policy in terms of whether it has left itself the freedom to do what Barbara just described in the Virginia Tech situation or not. And uh, it, uh, uh, and there, there ends up being a, a need to pick and choose also where, where to draw the line and, and, and to fight the subpoena. Um, and the large, you know, the AOLs, Yahoo's, Google's of the world have, in many cases, uh, when there's a sense of, of, of abuse of the process going on, often these John Doe suits where somebody just with no judicial supervision at all just sets up a lawsuit and uses it as a platform for issuing subpoenas, that's a potentially extremely abusive situation where there's no one else to push back but the re recipient of the subpoena. In many cases, those large organizations do push back but I think in the vast majority of the cases, they, they, they just don't have the, uh, the, uh, the wherewithal and the, the stake in it to actually push back every time. Uh, they do very hard, and I think news organizations do the same, to try to give notice to the, if they have it, to, if they have the knowledge of who the real person is behind the uh, pseudonym, to give that person notice so he or she can uh, uh, take their own steps to protect their identity, and there have been a number of cases, although not a huge number, where people have had the wherewithal and been able to find um, uh, lawyers through folks like David or others to be able to represent themselves and, 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 and resist that. And, and, and Jeff and, and Bill, is it, is it important there be spaces online for people to engage in anonymous speech? I mean, why, why should we care if, uh, if, if news organizations start to decide that they're simply not going to let anonymous comments? Is that a, is that a problem? Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a problem. I mean, from broadsheets in the Federalist Papers right up to current time, and and wanting to protect, to protect whistleblowers or give them a place mm -hmm. uh, to be protected from retribution, we need pseudonymous pseudonymous comments. But I think if I were running a news organization now, I would try to figure out a bifurcated system where there would be a place for pseudonymous comments, but also a place where people who aren't comfortable experiencing that kind of uh, comment can can be in the same sort of environment as they were in in the letters to the editor world of the print newspaper. I, I, I really like what Bill has said. I mean, I think, you know, I think one thing that's hurt us is, is, uh, is, a, uh, a, is the conviction of, of how important, you know, anonymous, anonymous uh, comments are uh, for all the excellent reasons Bill's listed, and that is true. But there's just, uh, you know, I feel that that the, that zealotry ignores the fact that an anonymous commenters have really poisoned the well, and we have to figure out a way that that the majority of people who just want to come and talk about an article that their that their reputation needs to be at stake to some extent, so that they can be held to account, um, because otherwise, just the comments are. <sighs> and I would add, uh, I, I'm curious uh, if you do your own self-reflection, because um, I've looked at my RSS reader, and uh, in the end, I know. Every, the author of every single person in my RSS reader. Um, I've never been able to stick with a uh, pseudonymous blogger, for example. Um, it's not that I am philosophically opposed to it, I think it's great, but almost always knowing the source of the content and why they're saying what they're saying is essential for me to give it credibility. Uh, actually, a, a number of newspapers around the country are experimenting with comments on their Facebook fan pages. Um, and those comments are attributed because it's within the Facebook environment. Now, I, I, I assume somebody could That's have a fake Facebook page, but, but uh, and, and what I've heard is that the comments on the Facebook pages are much more um, thoughtful and the conversation that develops is more coherent and, and actually productive than the anonymous comment discussions. So, and, and do you want me to mention what the Washington Post has decided to do? Yeah, I mean, so, so the Washington Post um, uh, 
phased, tiered implementation that's going to be having, I think, is an excellent uh, example of using. Yeah, I think it's, it grows out of the same kind of frustration yeah. with the um, un uncivil discussion, rude, obnoxious behavior that sometimes develops online. Um, and, and you know, as I mentioned, we have this three strikes you're out uh, tool. Uh, apparently, the post is adopting something even more nuanced, where. Um, readers will be divided into tiers. Uh, so, you know, the top tier would be trusted commenters. Um, middle tier would be, I guess, some comment, comments hadn't been, uh, you know, vetted quite so carefully. And then a third would be purely anonymous uh, first-time posters, et cetera. Uh, and so as a, as a user of the site, you could choose which discussion you wanted to take part in. Um, and, and, and for first-time users of the sites, the, the, co the comments that you would see first were those from the trusted advisors. So you'd have to dig really deep to see those, you know, anonymous uh, posts that uh, can get sort of rowdy. And the post has, a bo has a, had a bozo filter for a long time, which I think is a wonderfully named way of uh, allowing the people who make these uh, really outlandish comments to think that their comments are still up on the site, but in fact, they're the only ones who see it. <laughs> Everyone else who comes to the site doesn't see the comments. We, we have that too. It's part of you the plug technology. Yeah. You better keep it's, it a secret. Yeah. It, it's, it's part of, the, I think, the 1990s way of thinking that uh, when you're dealing with user comments, you have two choices. Either don't do them, or every comment gets treated equally, and you have a dumb sorting filter like chronology. And I think we've learned that that doesn't give the right results, that not every comment is equal, and that you do have to make distinctions among comments. Ideally, you can make them on an automated basis rather than manually, but um, that's the only way, I think, to allow people to have their say um, and not get overwhelmed by the junk. And if you think about it, the real world analogy is what you would hear in your private club is different from what you'd hear at the supermarket that you go to in your community is different from what you hear uh, outside the public bathroom on Main Street. So, so before we get to, to Q&A, there's a sort of wonderful gift we've been given, a little bit of a teaching moment um, that brings a lot of these issues to the forefront involving the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which um, uh, I'm not sure how long ago, but uh, they noticed that there was a, uh, a commenter on their site with the, with the acronym, uh, with the, uh, the, the moniker Law Miss, who had been posting for quite a long period of time and was recently posting comments about the mental state of one of the plane dealer's reporter's relatives. Um, and uh, that reporter then went into the system, um, their registration system, determined uh, the email address that had been used to register the account, uh, went and looked back over the history of this person's commenting uh, on the site, which had been very extensive, and saw that they had been posting a lot about um, legal cases uh, in Cuyahoga uh, County court system. Um, they put two and two together and determined that the person who was, who was using this, uh, this account was, in fact, a judge on the bench in Cuyahoga County. Um, and that those comments were being made about parties uh, in cases in front of her, um, about the, the lawyers in the cases. And um, I would imagine, I don't know this from the reporting on it, that, they, that the reporter took that information to their editor and said, do we have a story? And the editor said, we've got a judge here who's potentially um, violating her obligations as a judge. Um, I think we need to report on it. And they did. And they, they outed her. Um, and that created quite a brouhaha. Um, up until about uh, last Tuesday, she had been saying that her daughter or a family member had been using the account. That's, a, that's the classic thing you see in these cases. That, that's, you know, every, anybody can use it, and it isn't me. Um, when uh, on Tuesday she filed uh, a lawsuit against the Cleveland Plain Dealer claiming breach of contract. And it, so it goes to our question about what did the privacy policy permit the uh, news organization to do with the information. But before we dive into that, I first want to tackle the very first issue, which is um, when a news organization has the opportunity to uh, examine the, the records associated with commenters on their, on their site, um, should they? And then uh, that, once we answer that question, once they get information like that, w what's the decision-making process that goes into whether or not to, uh, to make the information public? I'll take a quick shot at that. I think the answer is it depends what their terms of service and privacy policies are with their users. I, I, because uh, 
Barbara found, found uh, a, a reference to the uh, filed case. I, I read the lawsuit. And um, the plain dealer's policy uh, says that they will hold your stuff confidential except in cases of legal process and other official things. It uses the word official. So I think they're going to end up in the position of having to argue that what they were doing was official in the sense that they were starting a kind of official internal review of what was going on. But I think that, that probably uh, there's going to be some review about that language now uh, there and at other news organizations. I, I think that you're just going to have to have very explicit privacy in terms of use policies and stick to them. I don't know why uh, the news organization, why the newsroom should have special access to that data uh, that, that other people don't have. Well, this, is, this was not a Gannett paper, no. um, advanced publications. Uh, and shortly after they, um, they, they wrote the story identifying the commenter, they did change their policy. The newsroom no longer has access to the information that's collected as part of user registrations. Um, so they've sort of answered that question, Bill. Going, going yeah. forward, they're not going to be put in that position. But, but so, so, so we've, got, we've got two interests in tension here. One, we've got the, this idea of, of, of maintaining a, a, a community that can uh, rely on expectations, expectations around um, their privacy. And on the other hand, you have a journalistic um, an assess obligation, in a sense, or certainly a, 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 an interest in, um, in reporting on a judge sitting in the community who may be violating her oath as a judge. Um, it, 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 how do you resolve a tension like that? Well, and is uh, a, does a lawyer get involved in that, typically? Well, uh, we had a situation somewhat similar, I think distinguishable in a couple of key respects uh, at our newspaper in Pensacola, um, where um, the newspaper got a tip that the author of some comments that had been posted about the school system was actually an elected member of the school board. Um, and the comments that this particular poster uh, had put on the site were uniformly racist. Um, so for example, when there was a story about uh, the test scores falling, this poster went on, it went under the name, by the way, Godzilla. Godzilla went on and said, well, if you compare those, you know, scores for the white districts with the minority districts, you'll see where the real um, weakness lies, um, and so on and so on. And, 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 you know, consistent and repeated racism in these comments. And, uh, so the newspaper called the school board member to say, um, is that, you know, have you been making these posts? And the school board member said, you caught me. Uh, and at that point, um, they were about to, to, to publish the story, and then the school board member called back and said, well, I, I actually, I'm not Godzilla. I just think a lot like Godzilla. <laughs> so they were like, what? <laughs> So somebody said, well, let's just check to see who has, oops, who has signed up for this, talk about anonymity, who has, uh, who, who this is that's, that's, that's posting these comments, and they did indeed have the email address, and it was the same email address that the school board member had used when writing op-eds for the newspaper. So they, you know, that cleared up the confusion over who, who or what Godzilla was or thought, but in any event, so they did publish it. And huge outcry developed our community. Uh, I happen to be the ethics officer for our company, and um, we must have gotten 30 ethics complaints within a two-day period from people saying that the newspaper had acted unethically in, in unmasking the school board member. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there was even a CJR article on it, um, and the CJR article concluded that, you know, it's a kind of a murky area, but I was pleased because the article looked at our terms of service and said what they did was justified under the terms of service uh, because ours were written a little bit differently than the Cleveland Plain Dealers were. But in any event, um, I, think it's, I, think it's a, I think it's a very gray area. But in that, in that situation, the editor of the paper, I asked him when the Cleveland Plain Dealer situation arose, I said, you know, what do you think about your decision to unmask God Godzilla? And he said, I've never thought twice about it. We had news under our roof about an elected public official. The conduct that was being displayed on our website was reprehensible for an elected school board member, and we felt the community should know about it. Uh, but I think it's a good example of you know, the clash of, of cultures, values, et cetera, that can develop when you've got a news organization, traditional news organization, and an online community under the same roof. 
and we, we saw a similar set of facts involving the St. Louis Dispatch as well a couple months ago where uh, they had a, um, uh, a comment that violated their terms of service was un un uncivil. And um, the person who moder the online editor who moderates the comments looked into the registration system, saw that the email address came from a local school, I think it was a teacher, and uh, notified the school administrator that this person had posted this inappropriate comment, and then the person was fired. Um, so, I mean, news organizations are grappling. But that, that was for, that, that almost seemed like tattling to me. Yeah. It wasn't for, a, you know, news gathering. No public news interest. Yeah, there, no yeah. public interest there. Yeah. So, so, so returning to this idea of, you know, obviously we're, we're lawyers and we're sitting and thinking and advising our clients on, on what they could do in a situation like that. The first thing we look is at the terms of service to determine what limitations there may be. But when you're actually, I would imagine that a lot of news organizations right now are examining their terms of service to make sure that going forward they're, uh, they're giving themselves the ability to do that. Um, how do you advise clients on, on that topic? I mean, if, on the one hand, you want to be transparent to the, to the users of your site about what you're going to be doing with the information. Um, and you want to make some, some promises to develop a robust community, but you also want to give the news organization uh, flexibility. Yeah, I mean, it, in, in normally my advice to, uh, to, uh, to these sorts of website operators is to, is to try to consider in advance the situations in which you may need or want to disclose and make sure you haven't promised uh, that you're not going, you know, that, that uh, you haven't promised more than you're going to actually uh, back up with your behavior. Uh, and once you've made the promise, uh, I, I think you really need, then need to stick to it until you get ordered by a court to, uh, to cough it up. Um, it, uh, my advice generally is, is in the nature of broadening the client's uh, statements about where they, will, uh, where they will disclose or where they may disclose. Um, uh, for example, you know, not to say in response to, you know, we'll turn it over in response to valid legal process. I'll take out the word valid, I mean, I, or, you know, or otherwise. I, 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 I want to really be thinking defensively on behalf of my client to not get into a situation where uh, I'm going to have to be coughing information up where I arguably have promised that I won't. I think this is a yeah, fox guard in the hen house problem that uh, we don't run into this in most other circumstances where you have online publishers who are operating um, online commenting uh, functions, they really don't care the identity of the people. And it would never occur to them to do a regression to say, who are these people and what are they doing? When they get the legal requests, when they get the subpoenas or the, um, uh, the court orders, then of course they, they deal with it. But when you're dealing with a news organization that thinks everything that is news needs to be reported upon, you have a fox around the hen house problem. I mean, I really think the appropriate response is to set up a little bit of church and state between uh, the online community and the uh, news gathering function. It just seems like um, otherwise you have to say everything's fair game because that's the way it's going to be treated in practice. I mean, that was the problem here with the plain dealer. I mean, and you can see what their immediate reaction was, was to set up, uh, apparently, what's been reported, to, to set up uh, the church state wall. Uh, the problem is, is that once, once you, for whatever reason, good or bad, mistake or not, have that information and now you know it's news newsworthy, now I've got this overarching obligation to my yeah, but community. When you, when you get a tip, that, I see that's entirely different than when you get it as someone rooting around I, in their own database. And so, you know, if you set up that wall properly, then you the don't have that situation. The news functioning, uh, news gathering uh, people shouldn't have a, any tainting or um, conflicts. As a reporter, let me clarify. Uh, if the tip has come in, then can I, as the reporter, access that data to do that regressive? No. Right? You shouldn't be able to. I agree. I agree. I think that's, and I think this is, I mean, this isn't from a legal perspective at all. It's just from the, an, you know, someone who's been active in online communities for a long time. Is, uh, you know, it, it sort of gets to this kind of hubristic uh, idea on the part of, of newspapers, I think, a lot of the time that, 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 well, you know, I mean, we built this house, so we decide what the house rules are. Well, you forget that there are houses all down the block. Everyone's going to go, you know what, there's a lot of places in Cincinnati to hold an online forum. And, and they'll go somewhere where, like you said, most online publishers don't care. They'll offer very generous protective terms of service. So I think that I think that newspapers, as a competitive, as a, as a strategic uh, uh, priority, need to think of let's protect these people, let's make them feel valued. So I'm going to open up the questions. And uh, Lucy, did you? Uh... Yes, I was going to ask about the Oh, okay. <laughs> Beat you to it. So go ahead. Remember, you can push the button on your microphone. The red light will come on. Just make sure you push it after you're done. 
Hi, I had a question about one other potential legal consequence of allowing comments on uh, newspaper website forums, which is the, the potential use of user comments as evidence of damage of reputation in a defamation action. And I've been involved in a number of defamation lawsuits where the plaintiff has sought to introduce um, evidence of user comments, not for direct liability, um, for the for the publishing of the contents uh, for the publishing of the comments, but to show the damage that the original news article caused to the reputation of the person discussed in the article, and I've seen cases where those have been allowed in, notwithstanding a Section 230 defense, because you're not seeking to hold them directly responsible for those comments. And while there are other evidentiary objections which can come up, authentication, hearsay, that kind of thing, you know, sometimes they come in under a theory, uh, you know, under the hearsay, under the reputation exception to the hearsay rule. So I was just interested in the panel's experience with that issue or whether that's something that you've faced. I haven't, I have not seen that come up. Um, within the language of 230, the question I suppose is, is that use a use that's treating the, uh, the website operator the, uh, as the uh, publisher or speaker of those comments? And, uh, I, mean, I haven't thought about it hard, but I, I, I think it probably isn't. Uh, uh, I'd like to be able to argue uh, to protect the, the news organization there from even that use of the speech, but I, I, I have a feeling that that's going to be tough to, to, to sustain under Section 230. I mean, that information would have been available if you could find it, even in other circumstances. It's just that it becomes codified and easier to find when the online comments are provided by the publication itself. Um, but, I mean, in the end, in my mind, that's just an adjustment for the liability that was created by the defamatory statement. In other words, if you've got the defamation, this just sweetens the pot, perhaps, but you need to attack it at the source. I haven't seen that, um, but uh, I, I think uh, I agree with Pat and, and Eric on that. Uh, I have a question. Th this conversation seems to have been focused on U.S. law. Uh, thinking about third-party contact from abroad, how, how concerned are you or should, how concerned should uh, organizations creating online communities be about how other countries view third-party content? I, I know sort of vaguely that places like Ireland or maybe the U.K. have different perspectives on the obligations of news, of online communities. Uh, is that something that online communities in the United States should be focused on, or is this merely just sort of an academic question at this point, or would it be something more concerning well, in the future? Well, no, this is, a, this is a real live important question. Um, in general, most other countries' laws are, many exceptions, but generally are nowhere near as protective of the website operator uh, as, as U.S. law is. And that was true even before Section 230. We had, you, had, you have the strong First Amendment protections and all that goes with that. Uh, there are uh, uh, lots of, and, and, and there are lots of, uh, since, you know, when you publish on the Internet, you're publishing or you're di disseminating universally, you, uh, you are exposed potentially to uh, liability in, 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 uh, in, in other countries. And there's a lot of, uh, analysis to be done as to whether or not, for example, an, a foreign judgment, if gotten under laws that are not as protective here, could that be enforced in the United States, for example? Uh, that helps if all of your assets are here in the U.S., but if you're a multinational company with assets in lots of places, then you really are sort of stuck having to uh, conform to or live by those rules or choose not to do business there. It's a, sort of the sort of th kinds of things that Google is having to, to think about in China. Uh, it's a very complicated question, and, and it, it, it's coming up more and more I'm, as I'm seeing it. We've definitely seen cases involving uh, U.S. publishers being held liable under foreign laws when they didn't actually publish in that foreign country. I'm thinking of the Dow Jones versus Gutnick case as an example. Um, and, um, you know, I, I want to sharpen a little bit what Pat said. When I deal with the Silicon Valley companies who have only U.S. offices, we just basically take a carte blanche approach. It's not our problem to worry about international law because there's not much that a foreign country can do to make, uh, make us pay for it here in the U.S. 
Pat could probably sharpen that statement further and say, well, it's not so clear, but for the most part, we take that. It, when, when companies uh, launch internationally targeted versions and set up operations on the ground in foreign countries, they have to comply with local law. And so we see these localized versions of services. And from my perspective, it's a big decision on the part of an internet company to decide to do a localized version um, because they're now basically embracing the laws of that country and they have to build a system that complies with that laws, oftentimes with very different DNA than the US site. So they have to just think differently from the get-go about how they architect that site. Um, so a lot of times what I see with companies is that they stay U.S. focused perhaps a little bit inordinately long because they don't have the resources to go and properly localize services for these um, foreign jurisdictions and they have to marshal up the capital to be able to do that. Sam? Um, this is a question for Eric. Uh, I want you to elaborate on a, a comment you sort of made in passing because I just find it really interesting. Um, you mentioned that you thought that Section 230, the, the lack of a records retention um, provision, was intentional and that it was brilliant. Um, and uh, I'd just like to hear you to explain wh why you think both of those things, especially in light of um, some maybe uh, unfortunate situations you, we might see like um, juicy campus websites where they do tend to, um, or did, uh, is sort of simultaneously encourage defamatory speech, um, hide behind Section 230, and then not keep very good records. Yeah, I, I didn't think I was going to get away scot-free on that <laughs> remark, uh, even if said flippantly. Um, and I, if I said it was intentional, um, that might have been an overstatement. I didn't mean it that way. I, I don't really know what the drafters thought. Um, something that we need to do a little bit of unpacking. Um, but, you know, it was Congress. So, you know, we know the degree of intelligence that went into the overall design of the statute. Um, but the reason why I'm a fan of the, um, the, 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 the 230 including sites that deliberately do not retain records and flush them is what 230 has really done and a lot of what we've been discussing today reflects the fact that there's a great degree of experimentation on the part of online publishers to figure out the best way to deal with third party content. There's a full menu of options. That's not true in other countries. In other countries, the liability regime is locked in a set of best practices that says, this is the way that you have to handle user comments. You only have one choice. Here, we have a full range of choices, and I think we're still learning about the best choices that might be available. It might be that there's more than one, that we don't simply have the model that we were talking about indirectly here, that you have to have some kind of tight filtration of user comments to make sure the discussion doesn't get out of hand. You can do that under 230 and you're insulated. There might be communities where the best solution is to let it be freewheeling, to let it be that everyone can avoid being responsible for their words. I don't know that I would choose to participate in that community, but I think that the fact we can have that community in our system actually gives us a lot more competitive advantage overall compared to uh, countries where that's not an option. I would add a, a, a cautionary note about that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with sort of let a thousand flowers bloom and, and that's great and I'm a big fan of free speech to the hilt. Uh, it, this is Congress and Congress can give us what it, it can taketh away with what it giveth. And uh, I think if most websites were suddenly flushing all their content in order to protect tortfeasors on their site, I'm not sure how long Section 230 would last. I agree with that, but I would also point out that the marketplace has the potential to punish those people. Juicy Campus has gone by way of example. It may very well be that there will be other sites that have decided to allow uh, uh, an, a wild and woolly discussion the marketplace is going to drum some of those people out. And so we only have the circumstance where sites decide that's in the best interest of their community and the marketplace can support it. And from my perspective, that's a healthy uh, a, a part of the continuum. Do, do, you, do you think a site like Unvarnished, which is in beta now and which has been written about a bit in the last few days, is so, is so at the edge of what's reasonable that it will in, invite changes in Section 230. What you know, Unvarnished is purporting to do is they're going to set up a website where you can make any comment you want about any other person and it stays up. And it's like the, LinkedIn gone rogue. Right. That's a good analogy. That's yeah. a good analogy. And so what I worry about is that that will be the exception that will get 
uh, folks in Congress saying, geez, we need to amend this 230. I think there's a lot of people worked up about unvarnished, um, and we have to see if it's viable in the marketplace. So, you know, I'm skeptical. Let, let's, let's put that aside for a moment. Just to be clear, I would characterize unvarnished a little bit differently. Unvarnished is a consumer review site. It's just, it allows coworkers to evaluate each other. And that's a piece of information that actually is extremely difficult to get today. If you look at the ways that you can learn if someone is a good coworker, that information marketplace has effectively collapsed. And Unvarnished offers a potential that it might actually revitalize a market that has, has been destroyed by people being concerned about their liability. Now, Unvarnished is, not, is going to be a, a pseudonymous site. It's going to be people who will have some traceability to their remarks. And because of that, it's not clear to me that people who at least understand the law will say things that they should not say on there. In other words, anyone who goes off and rips their coworker or a new one might very well be looking at that as was a better house decision. That might not be a good, sustainable model for Unvarnished or its contributors. Um, but from my perspective, Unvarnished is a logical consequence of this experimentation. It's a marketplace that maybe we need someone to solve. There would be no way to solve it but for the immunization of 230. We wouldn't even have this discussion except for the fact that we have a statute. But I come back to the marketplace. I remain unconvinced the marketplace is going to value the services at a price that will allow it to sustain. But if it does, then look at what a great win we got. We actually solved an information dilemma. We saw a marketplace collapse about uh, job references or coworker evaluations that maybe we find a solution for. That would be a really powerful thing. Yeah, um, I was wondering, just uh, almost kind of on the same note, um, I think what's interesting is there's kind of a gap in protection right now for victims of certain things uh, under 230, um, harassment or defamation or even death threats. Um, so if those things are posted online in a comment section, um, obviously there's, on the one hand, you could have a site that doesn't keep logs and there's no way to find out who posted it. <coughs> even if the site does keep logs, though, uh, let's say the site doesn't have an option for, a uh, option for a user to delete his own posts. So even if you could take a case to court and win a harassment or a defamation suit and you know, compel the poster to try to take his post down, he can't do it successfully. And now you also can't force the site to take it down because of 230. Um, just wondering your thoughts on, on... Just to clarify, we did see that exact example. This is the Blockowitz case. It involved ripoff report, which... Um, Ripoff report is, by its own terms, is designed to have people kvetch about vendors in the marketplace. Um, and uh, their policy is very clear. They do not remove comments that have been supplied by users. And so we actually had a situation where one of the posters went to Ripoff report and said, please take it down. And Ripoff said, yet. And now we have the circumstance, 230 might immunize that choice and the poster is asking it to be taken down, the harmed victim is asking it to be taken down, and the law seems to suggest that that still doesn't get removed. So I just want to be clear, that's, this is not just a hypothetical example. We have real life case where that issue has come up. I, I have things to say about it, but I've already done too much talking. Well, I think um, it's a good question, and uh, I, I teach, and uh, after a class I taught on Section 230, I had a student come up and uh, she was uh, she was born in China. Her family had moved when she was just a little girl, and uh, her father had been involved in a situation that where there was some f bad reporting on on his conduct, and uh, or, I mean inaccurate reporting. And uh, apparently, um, it's still out on the internet. And she just started bawling. And and I had been you know sort of. Uh, you know, what's all this grumbling? It's the internet, we're section 230. But that really brought it home to me <laughs> that, that, that we really can impact lives. And I've, I've talked to a lawyer at the New York Times about the same thing. Um, I, don't, I don't think you'd find a website today that wouldn't be willing to, con a, a news website, unless it were of the type that Eric just described, where their whole reason for being was they promised not to take down comments. I don't think you'd find many websites that wouldn't be willing either to think about taking the comments down or take comments down and, and perhaps even uh, false reporting. 
And just to be clear, I think the ripoff report is extremely unusual as a site that refuses to take down comments at a user's request. We find very few websites like that. So in practice, what happens is once a plaintiff successfully gets some kind of adjudication in court, almost invariably the service provider then will do the courtesy, whether they're legally required to not, of removing the content. Well, I, I just, I think that you're right that that's a very low percent, but I think those are the ones we're most concerned about. Like uh, the auto admit case, for example, where, I mean, you know, as I've heard the story, some favors were called in and it got taken down, but, you know, presumably they might not have done it had the certain favors not been owed or something like that, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah, like I said, don't it's, forget it's, the, it's a low the, number of sites, but. Don't forget the complaints in auto admit hadn't reached a le legal adjudication. As I said, almost always service providers, once they have an adjudication, something's defamatory or otherwise illegal, they intervene. It's something like the ripoff report that does stand alone, and I think you would be hard pressed to find too many other examples about that. As for whether or not we should do something special for those cases, I think that's a discussion we could have. Uh, this is a question for the lawyers on the panel. Can you square the lack of a requirement under 230 not to retain records with the requirement under federal discovery laws that if you become aware of the possibility of a claim or a claim that you must re uh, retain all electronic records? I don't, I don't think there's a conflict. If you, if you are in a situation where the discovery rules or the rules to not spoliate are in play, they apply just as much to your log, web logs as they would to anything else, I would think. Uh, it just, it's, there, it, that can often be a difficult line to know where you are, but uh, uh, I, I'm not aware of a, of a, of a special uh, protection against spoliation here. Well, I'm, I, I'm thinking of a, a, a post that you look at and you know right away that it's either an invasion of privacy or a defamation, so you have the likelihood of a claim. Doesn't that fit under the rule? No. I, I, don't, I don't think merely seeing what might be a tort. And I've given that some careful thought um, <laughs> and, and looked at the cases. And it's not just that it might give rise to a claim, but that a claim has been asserted that you think might actually go to court. I think you The got threshold it. is higher than just, oh, maybe somebody might sue over that one day. I think you have to be careful about assuming that you can make good, accurate assessments about the legitimacy of content from, a, from an internal evaluation just by looking at it. We saw that at least in the Viacom versus YouTube lawsuit that uh, uh, YouTube was not in the position to decide what was copyrightable or not, given the fact that um, there were all kinds of explanations for why the videos were on their site, even though it looked like it was a copyright infringement. Yes. Some clarification on uh, 302, um, 230, sorry. It sounds as if you said that wire service reports online, if you publish those online, uh, and freelance reports, if you publish those online, that they would be third-party content and therefore not subject to the same rules as the information that would be in a print newspaper? Is that, that correct? That's what I said. I don't know if my co-panelists would agree with that. I, I, would, I would agree with that. And why, uh, does that make any sense? Because <laughs> in a newspaper, this, this is the good freelance news. freelance should embrace content, this. No, this but good I'm good sure. sick of it. Are you, are you saying if, if, if somebody were to, because it'd be copyright infringement if you didn't have the right to do it? I don't think you're asking that. You're no, asking you're, you're, no I'm I mean, saying if I were a freelancer and I were pu published in the newspaper and I also published something online, the, what's published in the newspaper would be subject to libel laws, but if it were published online, it would not be? Let's no, be it would, no, it would no, not no. be if you're a the reporter, publisher. If you're a reporter for a newspaper and you're basing your... No, I'm a freelancer. And this I'm is a, a question whether you, the freelancer, is liable or whether the newspaper is liable. Either. Who's well, the liable? freelancer is going to be liable for what he or she wrote. The fr freelancer uh, is either way. Is they, they have no party content across the board. Even if they got a contract from the from the. Uh, 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 if you got a contract saying that you that you would not be responsible for any. Well, well somebody else can case, someone else can insure you against right. that, but that's just insurance uh, or or something like well, that. Well, you know but, what I, I I think I think I take a more common sense view of that issue than you do, Pat. I mean, not that yours doesn't make sense, but you we were talking about this <laughs> on the. I think Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 in, in real life, I mean, there are these theories floating out there that if you hire a freelancer, contract with a freelancer to do work on your online site, then you're not responsible for that freelancer's work. 
Um, and indeed, there is a case, and, and it's, maybe it was your case. Was the Drudge case yours, Pat? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Matt Drudge was a blogger for AOL, and there was a suit, and AOL was not responsible, and he was a freelancer in AOL. And paid, paid quite well. And paid quite well. But, you know, um, I, I, I feel that if we hire a, a contractor and instruct that contractor to do this, that, or the other thing, um, and to write a report on a certain subject, and that report is posted on our website, <coughs> Um, I, I think it'd be a heavy lift to get 230 to apply to that type of situation. And so I, th I think in the common sense world, um, the newspaper would probably assume responsibility for your okay, work. Okay, because they have, and not with work that I've done, at least the Washington they Post has. They have not. Have. Have, yeah. Have. Yeah, well, and, that, and we would too, Ekin. Uh, my other question is, uh, say Craigslist does, in terms of advertising, they're not responsible for third party. But if that same advertising were in, say, the Washington Post ad, section, print, or online, it's going to be treated differently? Yes. Come on. It's exact it's same ad copy. copy. Exact same the, publisher. What is the logic of that? Well, we I mean, this is well, I, conversation. I'm going to have to cut it off because we're running out of time. But, but the, the fact is, is that Section 230 is a statute that has radically changed the common law liability around these topics. So. Those who, who took media law courses prior to 1996 learned a body of law <laughs> that, that still changed. exists in print yeah. and on broadcast, but, but not online. online. Is, is totally different. So you can't take common sense and try to reason your way through. No, no, <laughs> no. Well, I, 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 I would say that there is enormous common sense behind the, the rule that yeah, As I David think, no I, doubt agrees. Yeah, I, I, I like it, but it doesn't make any well, sense. It, what it is does the common sense? Love it. What it, is it? Well, it has, <laughs> it has to do with the huge quantities of information that are flowing and what's possible and whether you can have something like the Internet if you don't have a rule I, I'm, uh, I'm like sorry. this. Th look, this is a subsidy that Congress granted to online publishers as opposed to print publishers. We Thank could you. question right. the value of the subsidy. That makes the sense. reality is that we've seen in a massive growth of uh, the online publishing world protected in part by the subsidy. This is all, in my opinion, good news. The, the internet as we know it today will go away without Section 230. But so may the print. All right, we have it. So, so we're going to have to close. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have another panel. And you can ask them these questions. We may or may not be able to answer it. But I want to thank my panelists and thank you all.